There is a grave somewhere out in the countryside with an inscription saying, The Unhappiest One. There's no name, no date, just a tombstone. Out of curiosity, some of the villagers decided to dig up the grave. In that grave, they find no one. There's no body. Alright, so that implies that this unhappiest person is among us somewhere. But who could it be? Well, you might be unhappy, I don't know. I'm just speaking to a large, diverse group of viewers. But do you think that you could be the unhappiest person? Well, we're gonna go through what type of person the Danish philosopher Saren Kierkegaard believes this unhappiest person to be. So either you're not this person and you could be like, hey, I'm not that asshole. Or you find out that you are that person and you could be like, damn, I am that asshole. Welcome to Philosophy Tunes. Today we're going back to Kierkegaard's Either Or, specifically the chapter on the unhappiest one. So the chapter starts out like this video started out, with the story about the grave. Now why do you think the grave of the unhappiest one was empty? Well if you consider life to be a painful experience, then wouldn't you want to be able to die? Wouldn't you want to escape this unfortunate life? We could then also explain why the grave was empty, to indicate that the unhappiest person was one who could not die, could not slip down into a grave. For the unhappiest would be the one who could not die, the happy man the one who could, happy the one who died in his old age, happier the one who died at birth, happiest of all the one who was never born. Now this is a bit of a depressing view of life, but if you're the unhappiest person in the world then obviously you're not going to have, let's say, the brightest view of life. If you're vibing through life, listening to the beach boys, hanging out with friends in the forest, then obviously your perspective is going to be different. But we're trying to find the unhappiest one. And if one's life is unhappy, the loss of the ability to die would make them the unhappiest. But we're not out of the woods yet. Because obviously everyone has to die. It's the ultimate certainty in this world. So we have to look amongst the living to still determine who this unhappiest person would be. Now Kierkegaard first notes that no specific person will be this unhappiest person. But rather, the unhappiest person is a group. Maybe we should then say the unhappiest people. So it looks like your chances of being one of these unhappiest people just went up. For this we will not deny that no particular individual is the unhappiest. It is a class. Alright, so let's look for what traits are present in this unhappiest group of people. Kierkegaard thankfully gives us a one sentence conclusion that will guide us through the rest. The unhappy man is always absent from himself, never present to himself. I know, I know, it sounds like some philosophy mumbo jumbo as of now. But like a lot of Kierkegaard's ideas, we can make this make very concrete relatable sense, even if he makes it difficult for us. So let's start here, what does it mean to be absent from yourself? So the unhappy one is absent, but one is absent either when living in the past or when living in the future. Okay now hopefully that makes a little more sense. If you're constantly reminiscing about the past or if you're always looking forward to something, then you're not really living in the present. You're not enjoying things that are right in front of you that you're experiencing now. But let's be real here. A lot of us daydream about the past or the future. It's arguably impossible not to. You can't always be in the present. And yet, we can't all be the unhappiest ones. Furthermore, if you're hopeful about something in the future, even if you aren't necessarily present, isn't being hopeful a good feeling? Like when you're a kid and you're in the drive-thru of McDonald's, and you're hopeful for a really dope Happy Meal toy. I wouldn't call that an unhappy experience, on the contrary. It's a positive, exciting experience. But Kierkegaard is going to make some specifications here that will calm our objections. But when the hoping individual would have a future which can have no reality for him, or the remembering individual remembers a past which has no reality for him, then we have the genuinely unhappy individuals. So Kierkegaard tackles our objections in two ways. One, specifying that the remembering individual remembers a past that has no reality, and two, that the hoping individual hopes for a future that has no reality. Let's start with this remembering aspect. Obviously, if you've lived a good life, you might look back on it well. But what if you lived not so much a bad life, but a regretful life? Kierkegaard uses the example of someone who never had a real childhood. Then they watch movies like The Sandlot and learn about other people's childhood and look back and see... nothing. They have no reality to remember. They don't remember something happening, but remember something not happening. They've missed out, and now they're obsessed with the past that they did not live. That does not exist for them. So that's the remembering aspect, which I think is very comprehensible. Now on to the second aspect of this unhappiest person, which is the hopeful aspect. This is how Kierkegaard specifies this part. He constantly hopes for something he should be remembering. 
his hope is constantly disappointed. But on its being disappointed, he discovers that the reason is not that the goal has been moved further on, but that he has gone past it, that it has already been experienced, or is supposed to have been, and thus has passed over into memory. So the hope element is a hope for that experience that the person missed out on. Like if you missed out on prom and are hoping to get that experience somehow. So here we see these two elements both being present in this unhappiest person. They're living in a past that isn't real for them, and they're hoping for a future that cannot happen. His misfortune is that he has come to the world too soon, and is therefore constantly arriving too late. He is forever quite close to the goal, and the same moment at a distance from it. So now that we know who this unhappiest person is, what is the takeaway? Well, you gotta live your life. In this part of the book, Kierkegaard is writing as an aesthetic character, and these are the aesthetic arguments for how to live life. Go out there, take risks, and experience the joys of life before it's too late. Go ask out that person you have a crush on. Go start that art project that you think is just too big. Go to the gym even if it's overwhelming. To me at least, it's better to try and fail than to never try and wonder what if later in life. So I'll close out this video with a final quote about this unhappiest person that I think poetically captures the experience. He cannot become old, for he has never been young. He cannot become young, for he has already become old. In a way, he cannot die, for he has never lived. In a way, he cannot live, for he is already dead. Sorry to end on a depressing note, but hopefully it's a good call to action to take risks and live life. If you enjoyed the video, then like, subscribe, and hit the bell. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.